Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third issue briefing of day three here in the Media Village at the World Economic Forum Annual Meeting 2016. We've had a couple of very interesting subjects already this morning. We've been talking about plastic in the ocean and the uh, a similar related topic of cleaning up after the Fukushima disaster. Now we're pivoting towards one of our perennial and most important subjects. I think possibly the most essential topic of discussion here this week at the World Economic Forum. It's the matter of inequality and the in inequality challenge, to give it the precise title. It's a subject we've been tracking for a number of years. It's been on the programme for a long time here in uh, Davos annual meeting, um, specifically in our research at the forum since 2011, I believe. Inequality has been labelled as the, uh, the, you know, the number one global risk. More specifically, more recently, we're doing some research into this, and I'm sure we'll talk about this during this short session. But with an eye to time already, I'm going to keep my remarks to a minimum and, and crack on with the session. I will just interview my, uh, introduce my three esteemed panellists. Delighted to have Winnie Bianima here, the Executive Director of Oxfam International. Catherine Garrett-Cox, to my extreme left, is the CEO of Alliance Trust and Investments. And we're going to be hearing the business take on inequality and what business is doing about this subject. Last but not least, Charlotte Petri Gornitska, Director General of the Swedish International Development Corporation, CEDA in Sweden, of course, and are very, very keen to hear what development assistance can be done to leverage the efforts to address and arrest inequality. Winnie, over to you first. Oh, thank you. Friends, I mean, Davos again, talking about inequality. You will have heard our message, our headline, Oxfam. Five years ago, 388 individuals had the same wealth as the poorest half of the planet. Now that number is down to 62. 62 people who have what 3.5 billion other people have to share between them. The global 1% now own more than everyone else combined. Governments and businesses can and must work for more inclusive economies. And the solutions aren't radical or divisive. They're in fact about rebuilding the ties that have been broken over the years. Let's take two issues, important. Let's start with tax and public investment. The social contract between companies and countries in which they operate. And that is the basis of public-private partnership. Paying tax where you do business is the foundation of that contract. Inclusive economies need healthy people, educated people, good infrastructure and large markets, all this has to be paid by taxes. Yet, in 2014, corporate investment in tax havens was almost four times bigger than it was in 2001. Increasingly, business hides its money from being taxed. Companies must be incentivized to stop shifting their profits to tax havens and they should be sanctioned if they do. Secondly, wages. The old assumption was that as someone grew richer, they would create jobs around them. And these jobs would create demand in the local economy and then more jobs. But most people around the world, especially women, have seen their wages stagnate, depressing demand. So our research shows that average annual income of the poorest 10% in the world has risen by only $3 a year in almost a quarter of a century. And I don't have to say that the, the reward for those at the top has just been skyrocketing. Governments and companies must collaborate to drive an international initiative to promote a living wage for all workers in all countries and to close the gender pay gap. Just those two actions would actually reduce inequality considerably. Should I stop there for a while? We can come back. Yeah. Let's hear the voice of business, Catherine Garrett Cox for Alliance Trust. Well, I think the big question is, you know, the degree to which business leaders are simply paying lip service to this as a problem. And I think that unfortunately there are, <coughs> you know, there are still some people who are doing exactly that. <clears throat> and I think that if there's a word that always springs to mind about Davos, it's commitment. People love to talk about commitments here. And, you know, in our view, very strongly is that business leaders need to, need to step up and make a much stronger commitment 
to actually recognizing that you know, we are enablers of economic opportunity. And how can we really focus on this issue so that, so that the economy grows for the widespread benefit of all? And we have a very firm view at Alliance Trust Investments that if you choose to act against society, in time society will act against you. But at the end of the day, I think you know, words are one thing, but actions are far stronger. So we've actually um, made some very strong commitments internally um, within our own organization, and we very much want to encourage others uh, to, to step up to the plate. So this week at the annual meeting, we launched a piece of work, a white paper, where we are firmly calling on investors to integrate the SDGs into their investment analysis. Think about what you can do and how you can align your long-term investment philosophy absolutely in line with that. And clearly, uh, you know, addressing income inequality is a very core uh, part of that. The second thing that we're doing is a, a very strong focus um, in the UK initially, and let's not forget that people think of income inequality as being an emerging market problem. You know, even in our own hometown of Dundee, there are huge challenges. So we've launched um, a real push around financial education, recognizing that if people are much better educated on why they need to save and how they need to look after themselves for the future, frankly, you know, governments will be better off and governments and businesses can work uh, much better together. And the third point I would make in terms of action-based commitment, and very much in keeping with what Winnie's been speaking about, has been around the issue of tax. So as an investor, one of the things that we're always considering is, what is the risk to our long-term investment in this company or that company? And the risk around tax is not only of reputational risk, which clearly is something front and center of people's mind, but it's also about the earnings risk. If in some capacity a company is at the genuine reflection of their numbers is not holistic at this point in time, then some way down the track, uh, there is a potential risk that the numbers will be impacted. So on a very specific piece of work, we collaborated with the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, and we've engaged with 10 other investors, really seeking to find solutions and exploring ways that investors can be asking of their investee companies what are you doing in terms of corporate tax responsibility? Now, this is a, a huge piece of work. Um, we are doing it within our own portfolio. We're flagging companies up. We're having the active engagement. The work with the UNPRI was published last, last November, so uh, you can access it uh, openly uh, on the website. But it's a piece of work we're very excited about, and I think it fits very well with our own corporate values and mission, which is to create a much more sustainable future. Some really important topics, and again, we'll come back. And just to introduce to those of you who are unfamiliar with the format, there will be time for questions. But first, Charlotte, tell me about what kind of, how do you use the muscle of over -develop, overseas development assistance to push home important issues such as inequality? Well, I think it, it, it's what it's about. I mean, for, for, for us, the mission is to make it possible for poor people to, to prosper. I mean, that's, the, that's the, what we're about. And, and uh, you know, you can do that on many levels. The focus that we have had for so many years is to, is to and may I use the, the language of business, invest in women, uh, because we, we really need women to be, to have the opportunity to be productive. We know that if women create jobs, I mean, if they have a job, if they create opportunity around them, and if we can help them to, over, to overcome uh, when it's risky, through social security uh, so that they can stay in business. We also know that the money that they earn will be investment in family. It will be investment in education. It will actually deal with the root causes, maybe, of corruption. And if we go back to business, because we need business to, be, to, to invest, uh, but they are, they are hiding or maybe uh, true about the fact that as long as there is corruption, we're not going to invest. And, and I think that we really need to, to speak about the whole equation. What we are trying to do also is to support governments that are uh, stable enough to, to help them to build institutional capacity. We, we support them in how do you actually uh, run a, an effective tax agency. But because mobilizing tax is really what's needed in many of these companies that, uh, countries that are now, now growing. 
So mobilizing from people that you know have a job is one thing, and then distribute it in a way that people trust. So it's being distributed to health, to education, builds trust. And th those are the processes that we, with development money and development partnerships, are trying to support. So part of what we do is also to support an Oxfam organization, because they advocate for the important stuff, and, but we implement. But we also work with companies. And we don't want to be a, a partner with corporate sector if it's about lip service, because that will actually affect our reputation. So we, we need to be very sincere that when we partner, we, we deal with the real stuff, and we also discuss the tough things, uh, which means if you, if you are real about investing in job creation, you can't do that with your left hand and with, with your right hand, your, 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 your tax planning is actually not staying in the country, you see what I mean. So this, this dialogue is very important and it takes place here in Davos. Suitable time to pause for any questions if we have any. Gentleman at the back, two here. We'll, we'll take both, let's, take, let's get the microphone whizzing around the room. We'll start with the gentleman here. We'll just take a note of these. Thank you. Uh, Brian Grimm, I'm the chair of the Global Agenda Council on the Role of Faith. And I'd like to thank your comments on uh, the role of women, and I'd like to just point out that our council has produced, with the help of Sweden's archbishop, who's a woman, yeah. uh, a briefing on the role of faith in addressing the global challenges, including uh, inclusive growth. And I think faith is an undervalued, sometimes under-recognized, part of the solution, uh, thinking of Pope Francis, thinking of the Archbishop of Sweden having a voice. So uh, I, I applaud you for uh, your concern for role of women. The role of faith. We have role to be quick because these sessions are very, very short, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen at the back, let's have you and if you just for the benefit of our audience online, if you could give us your name as well, please. Yes. Um, it's working. Okay. My name <coughs> is Tsepo from the South African Broadcasting Corporation. My question is to Winnie. I mean, the issue of tax havens, we keep on harping on them every summit, every G20, every <sighs> Davos. But it seems there's nothing coming to the fourth. I mean, as Oxfam, really, are you going to have this kind of energy going forward of really talking on one thing all over the, the time without any action that has been uh, following uh, decisions that have been taken? And to Catherine, from a moral point of view, does really business support these calls for them to stop diverting cash uh, in not supporting where they invest? Thank you. Okay, and uh, take the last one here. So that's business values, tax havens. <coughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Alan Winfield, Bristol Robotics Lab UK. Um, I'm terribly excited by emerging developments uh, uh, or initiatives in universal basic income, and I'd be very interested in the panel's view on on the universal basic income. Thank you. Excellent. Something I was going to raise myself if nobody else had. All right, one more, sir. Uh, more than a question to just a specific question, I would like to point out one issue and I want to comment from your side. Uh, I'm very sympathetic with the idea to promote more equality. I mean, nobody can think different. But on the other hand, when you put the thing like, I mean, the reason there is poor people is because we have to, to have to rich people. Is is that the kind of uh, a dilemma? Uh, maybe we will suppress. It was it would it would say okay, let the the rich people are the evil here. If one percent is taking all the money that all the country are producing, these people are evil. But at the same time, I don't think it's that simple. I want you to comment about how you can the middle ground. This is the middle ground between yeah, yeah make to live together because we need entrepreneurs. We need people to create wealth. But at the same time, we need these people to pay taxes, etc. I would like to uh, see. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Well, that's a decent, that's a decent haul of questions. Where do, we, where, do, where do we start? The middle ground, I think. That's quite, a, that's quite a personal one. We need wealth, wealth creators. In fact, Pope Francis, in his message on Wednesday, yeah, her yeah, heralded the noble profession of business and wealth creation, whilst at the same time warning business leaders to not forget the poor. Seems like an, an adequate way to kind of uh, invite you to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take a go at this one, Winnie? Maybe. I will. 
<laughs> I think thought you would. <laughs> yeah. I think this issue of middle ground is, uh, can disguise what the problem is. We know why inequality is rising and rising rapidly. And we need to tackle those reasons. It's to do with rigged rules of the economy. It wasn't always like this. But the rules have increasingly been rigged because wealthy individuals, rich companies, can influence the rules of the game. And they have used their power to do that. So over the years, the policies of deregulation, privatization, globalization, secrecy of financing, all these have worked in favor of a small group. So now we need to untangle that. So it's not that some people are evil and others are holy, but it's about looking at the economy in the face and see how do these rules work. Let me give you an example, South Africa for you of SABC. In 1993, as apartheid was ending, the top 10% was, had a, a total income of about 36 or so billion. This was in 1963. Te 17 years later, in 2010, apartheid is gone. This top 10 has increased their wealth by 64%. The bottom 10% in total had an income of about a billion. It stayed the same. 17 years later, they are still where they were. This is what we're talking about. It's about how the rules of the economy work. If wages are stagnant and the top is increasing, if money is untaxed and super profits are gained and there's nothing going into health and education to give opportunity to all, so we're saying that this kind of inequality isn't just bad for, for poor people. It's bad for the rich because there's not enough investment going into people to be educated, to be healthy, to work for infrastructure, to support the businesses to thrive. So it's bad for everybody. It's a drag on growth. It traps people in poverty and it sparks social unrest. If you take Latin America, the most unequal region in the world, 41 out of 50 most violent cities in the world are in Latin America. So Catherine, can we raise yeah. income levels of the bottom half of the population as well? What, what, is, the, what, what is your take on this? Because if well, you have extreme wealth at the top, you also have inadequate levels of income at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Is that another way of looking at it? Well, I, 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 th I think it is. But I also wanted to come back to the question about, you know, do business leaders share the, the moral purpose? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I reflect what I said at the beginning, that increasingly, yes, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think I completely agree with what you say, that there have been many years of this discussion. So why now? What will be different? Because frankly, you know, it's enough talking already. You know, let's talk more action. And I think the action is going to be very much supported by the SDGs because it was a rallying call. We have 15 years to put this right. We have a huge responsibility, whether we're in business, government, NGOs, whatever it is, to leave the world in a better place for our children and grandchildren. And I think that's why I'm actually quite hopeful because I think that there will increasingly be a divide, an unequal gap between businesses who get it and those who do not. And I'm very optimistic that, frankly, this will be driven by decisions by the millennials because they do not want to invest or support companies or practices where bad things are being promoted. And so I, you know, I am helpful, uh, hopeful. And I think that at the end of the day, it really comes down to education. So I think, you know, us asking and working with businesses, other businesses, government uh, and charities, NGOs such as Oxfam and others, you know, if we can educate people better, I think we can lift many more people out of poverty. Can I agree with business here? <laughs> more than welcome. Please do. <laughs> that it's really not going to be just regulation. It's going to no. be values that must mm. shape the tax behavior mm. of companies. It is values. We have to mm, yeah. move it's away from about. legal compliance mm. to this tax responsibility, which is driven by values. Do and good for the company and do good for the world. So my question to you, Winnie, if I may, Corporate social responsibility is now entrenched in most organisations. And, and how do we get that? So that's a value shift, that's a change in culture. How do we apply that ability to change a culture to the issue of tax? Your yeah, corporate social responsibility has been narrowed to a little doing good, building a few schools somewhere, 
while the production is not guided by the values. The values must guide the business right through the supply chain. That's what we're talking about. And the tax responsibility must be driven by the same values. It can't be about having a project that makes you look good and then the business is done in ways that exploit people and the planet. But I, I think that we have to realize that the mm. process has started because I, uh, I want to believe that, uh, that we are all value-driven. <coughs> uh, but if, if we aren't the business uh, value-driven, there's a business case for if, if you can be long-term enough. There is a business case in investing in good values in Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, because that's where you have to go. Mm. Uh, and, and if we can kind of uh, uh, accept the fact that some are value-driven, mm. uh, and hopefully many more will be, mm. uh, but s start from a pragmatic point of departure, realizing that if you're going to be successful long-term, you cannot waste that yeah. by doing something good on the side and ignore the fact of tax. Yeah. So that's why the dialogue is so important. But we need to allow time. I think we need to look at family-owned business. Uh, we have some examples like, uh, not necessarily on tax, but on, on how they invest in, mm. in, in social responsibility, like IKEA and H&M and others. I, I mention them because I know them best. Uh, they, they take risks because they don't have quarterly reporting. So there are also, also uh, things that we have to start to look into. And I, I think that the younger generation is a good catalyst in doing this as well. And can Those I, who can choose. And can I just so. say very briefly that it, it is about values, but it's about language. So if you're sitting down and talking to business people, probably the best way to tackle is you are running a risk if you don't take exactly. corporate tax mm. effects yeah. on your earnings, on your reputation into account. And just to your point about faith, um, bizarrely, they uh, asked me to chair the Global Agenda Council on Values. Mm -hmm. So it's quite refreshing that the business voice is put very uh, firmly at the heart of uh, values decision making. Let's cover universal basic income. Yeah. Winnie. You were close to it. <laughs> the issue of, of what, what was the Universal ba basic income. Yeah. And your thoughts yeah. on it. Absolutely. It's a fairly open-ended question. Mm. It, it, it definitely, because if you look at the last quarter of a century, really the wages of the people at the bottom have remained static. The, even now, after the financial crisis, we still saw skyrocketing rewards mm for the very people who had caused the crisis. But wages remain stagnant. In India, the head of an IT company, the head of an IT company earns 416 times more than an average worker. 416 times. I mean, what does this head of a company do in a day that is so much more than what an average worker does? So un un unless we really drive an international mechanism that will ensure that every worker gets a living wage. We have millions of people who are trapped in jobs where they can't pay their rent or, pay or buy food. This is not acceptable. This is not the world where businesses want to thrive. So we need a, yeah. a, a, a new force into restoring the contract between business and and people, business and states, which is about paying their fair share of taxes, reducing a wage gap, and ensuring that everybody benefits from the growth. And there are, there are some models out there. Yes. Uh, the textile industry, for instance, is, is rallying around this issue of, of, of wages. And, and we, as a development agency, is, we support that process with some seed money to make the mm. dialogue between mm. factory, company, industry, to really work with, in this, in this case, it's very much about women because it's a textile mm. industry. Mm. But women are educated that they have rights. Women are educated that they can organize themselves at the factory level so that they can also be a voice for their, their wages, not just depending on we, what we say here, but really to equip them. And why is this interesting for the, com for the company? Mm. Because they don't need fights. Uh, they, need, they need stability, mm. predictability to, to maintain their business. So it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the textile industry could really, uh, you know, 
uh, inspire other industries. Catherine, if there's a business case for universal basic, basic income, why hasn't it been implemented yet? I think it's still pretty early, to be honest. And I mean, I think let's think about how long it's taken to get a genuine corporate social responsibility going round uh, at, at conversations like this. I think that is part and parcel of it. Mm. Um, I, I think business has been late to the conversation, but that doesn't mean we're not absolutely yeah. opting into the discussion now. So, I mean, I think from, from my perspective, I strongly believe that finance can be a genuine force for good. There are a huge number of very enlightened individuals mm. on this topic, you know, and we're ready, we're stepping up to the discussion. And as I said before, I think those who will be there will persist, their organisations will thrive and prosper, and those who do not will simply be, uh, be just uh, consigned to the dust heap. But if I may add, it also has to do with consumers. You see, if you think of a garment manufacturer, <coughs> uh, the business does not really the, the company owner doesn't need a law to tell them to give a living wage to create good conditions of work so that people don't women don't die in factories they don't need a law they just need to be people of good values to understand that their workers need safe environment and a good wage but why don't they they don't because somewhere out there there are consumers who want to buy this jacket at just $5 and after two months throw it away, buy another one for a low price. Mm. So it also has to do, and I want to agree with mm. Catherine, Good with case. citizens' education mm. for people who buy, who when we are consuming, to consume understanding the production line, understanding the consequences for somebody down the line who's making the product. Mm. So there's a lot to do mm. to educate the mindful public. of time, mindful of our, our Swiss-like adherence to <laughs> strict yes. schedules. I do want to get one more final question. So I'm going to ask you to give us a quick answer to this one. The theme of this meeting is the Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's been recognised one of those, the greatest fears of the Fourth Industrial Revolution is inequality. So let's not talk about whether we fear it or embrace it, but what are we going to do to ensure that society is served by this technological transformation? Charlotte, would you like to start? Uh, I think it's very important to, to uh, see it as an opportunity. Uh, also, and to, to make uh, uh, poor people getting access to new technologies. And we have examples in Africa where that is happening. If you see the MPS, the mobile banking, you can actually see that some things are leapfrogging what is happening in my part of the world. So I, I really think from a development agency, we need to see the upside of new technologies and, and ask business to actually be part of equipping people Women of are, are left, not left behind, but have less access to, to new te technologies. So I think we have to deal with that. So the question is bigger mm -hmm. than that, but mm -hmm. I'll s stay there today. Catherine? <laughs> and, and I think my quick answer would be, what can business do to ensure that the advances in technology genuinely improve the lives of everyone around the globe? You know, not just a few people. So what can we do to broaden the spread mm -hmm and broaden the impact. For me, it's ultimately all about impact. Winnie. For me, technology can be value neutral. But if technology is in the hands of <coughs> a few who have already got themselves yeah. to buy the lawmaking process, the policy making process, technology will be used to actually increase inequality more and more. Take the case of the pharmaceutical industries and how they make medicines and the the use of the intellectual property protection pharmaceutical companies in america spent 228 million dollars in 2014 just to lobby the american government they were not lobbying for the benefits of medicine for everybody it was to protect their profits through their technology so unless you can change some of those rules that put too much power in the hands of those who own technology to shape the rules and to take the profits from the technology and not to let them be shared by all, technology will drive inequality. But if we change the rules, if we reduce, if we disentangle political power from those who hold capital and technology, then technology can be on the to the service of humanity. 
So it's about technology, it's about rules, it's yeah. about values, yeah. mm. and it's about collaboration. Absolutely. We'd love to have you back here next year to see yeah. how that process is going. Thank you all very much. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for watching online. This session is now over.